Hello, I am Donita Brown, Children's Librarian at the Ardmore Free Library. And today I am here to do a Longwood Gardens Community Read Program. We are going to be using this book, Weird Plants by Chris Thorogood and published by Q Publishing. I wrote to both the publisher and the author and asked if we could do an online program since we weren't able to do our regular program at the end of April when our library closed. And they both said yes. So I'm excited to share some of the things that I learned while I was preparing this program. And I hope that it inspires you to try to get this book and read it for yourself. This book talks about adaptations for survival in a myriad of extreme, often hostile environments and the intrigue of plant evolution. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the author. His name is Chris Thorogood, and he is currently a botanist at the University of Oxford. He has a PhD in parasitic plant biology from the University of Bristol. He currently studies flora of the Mediterranean, flora means plants, with particular interest in parasitic plant speciation. Let's talk about vampire plants. Do you know that there's over 4,000 species of vampire plants in the world? They range from rainforest to the Arctic tundra, and they get their nutrients from other plants. Some of them have even developed to the point where they've lost all plant features. They have no green leaves, they have no stems, and some of them even have no roots mistletoe is an example of a hemiparasite. That means it still has some chlorophyll in it and can get some of its nutrients from the sun, but it gets some of it from its host plant. And then there's the Raffelsia. Its host is a tropical plant, the Tetrastigma. It lives in the forests of Southeast Asia. It produces a huge bud and it has the largest single flower on earth. It smells like rotting flesh to attract flies to pollinate it. Then there's the Hydenora. Its host is a succulent Eurobius in Southern Africa. It has no chlorophyll. It lives entirely underground until it blooms. And then when it blooms, it almost looks like an alien to me. It smells like feces, like poop, to attract dung beetles to pollinate it. And the last one that we're going to talk about, although there's lots more in this section, is called the dodder, D-O-D-D-E-R. But it is also called vampire lasso, or strangleweed, or witch's hair. I think from those names, you can tell what it does. It wraps its stem around the stem of its host and penetrates it to get its nutrients and water. But by the end of the growing season, it smothers the host. You'll see from this picture that the daughter is almost completely covering this poor thorn bush. In some areas, farmers hate this type of plant because it kills their crops. And that's what we're talking about with vampire plants. Now we're going to talk about killer plants. A lot of people like killer plants. They've evolved in areas that nutrients are scarce, like waterlogged swamps or rain-leached mountains. There's not very much nutrients in the soil, so they get their nutri nutritional value from other areas. There's nearly 600 species. These include pitcher plants, Venus flytraps, and sundew, among others. One is called the Lowe's pitcher plant. It lives only on a few mountain sides in North Borneo, and tree shrews feed on the nectar on the upper lid, and then they excrete into the bowl and the feces pr provides nutrition for the plant. There's the cane pitcher plant. It is 
The whole bottom of the plant is filled with liquid. It is 16 inches long. That's pretty big. And it has several liters of fluid. It lives on Mount Kinabalu in North Borneo and Mount Tabu Yukon, also North Borneo. It is a tree, true, tree shrew toilet, just like the other plant, but sometimes it's bigger. And so sometimes the tree shrews slip down and fall in and drown, and the plant gets to have nutrition that way. There's the trumpet pitcher plant. It grows in ferns and swamps in the southeast plains of the U.S. It is 35 inches tall, and it has lurid colors and sweet nectar that attracts the insects to come to it. But its sides are so slick that when they land on it to eat the nectar, they slip and they fall down into the bottom that is filled with digest digestive juices. And the yellow trumpet has a paralyzing narcotic in its nectar. And also, the bottom of the plant has downward pointing hairs that prevent the plant, uh, insects from escaping. Now, the most famous plants that eat insects and animals is the Venus flytrap. And it lives in the subtropical wetlands of North and South Carolina. It eats insects but it also can eat small amphibians and reptiles. The end of the leaf is only two inches across and it has long spikes on it, but the, it has minute internal hairs that when something touches the hair, touches it multiple times or touches multiple hairs, then the Venus flytrap snaps shut and captures the animal. The reason it doesn't snap shut with just one touch is that it would waste energy if there's nothing there except a leaf. But once it snaps shut, the prey starts to struggle, and that triggers digestive juices to be released. There's also the sundew. It is called living flypaper. It lives in nutrient-poor ferns and bogs, and all of its leaves have numerous glandular tentacles that secrete, secrete sweet mucilage to attract and ensnare insects. The insects land on the leaves and the sticky tentacles bend inward and capture them and then excrete digestive juices. Next, we have the fraudsters. Most insect pollinated plants provide some kind of reward to their pollinators for coming and getting the pollen and tra transferring it to other plants. But the fraudsters do not. They trick their, their pollinators. There is the Rothschild slipper orchid. It lives on Mount Kinabalu in North Borneo. And it is very, very rare. It has distinctive flowers that have small dark green spots that superficially resemble aphids. Parasitic wasps come along and they lay their eggs among clusters of aphids. But then when they've landed on the plant, they slip and they fall into shiny pouch-like structures. It's a one-way trip. They fall into the bottom, are covered with pollen, and then there's a a little tunnel that leads them out of the plant that has more pollen in it. So they're able to get out of the plant, but then they're covered in pollen and they go to the next plant and pollinate it. There's the flying duck orchid. Look at this. Doesn't it look just like a flying duck? And its flower also resembles female saw flies. The males come along and they grab the female and they try to fly off with her. But of course they can't because it's attached to the plant. But then they slip and they fall into the, the packet, the, pollen, the little thing of pollen and then they're able to get off and go to the next plant with pollen all over them. This uh, plant lives in South and East Australia. Then there's the monkey-faced orchid. It lives in Central and South America. It's rounded, if you look, it looks just like a monkey, but its rounded lower lip mimics forest-dwelling mushrooms. 
Not only does it look like a mushroom, but it smells like a mushroom. And so fungus gnats come along. They go from plant to plant and pollinate it. Then there's the bee orchids. It, they live in the Mediterranean basin. There are many, many different types of bee orchids. Their uh, flowers look like female bees. And not only do they look like female bees, but they produce pheromones that smell like female bees. So the males come along and they try to pollinate, they get the pollen all over them, and then they go to the next plant and transfer the pollen. And these are the fraudsters, some of the fraudsters anyway. Now we're talking about jailers. Jailers have developed a special chamber inside that's filled with pollen. Insects crawl into the chamber where the pollen is, but then downward facing spikes prevent them from leaving. They're showered with pollen overnight, and then the spikes wither and the insect leaves. Many species are also thermogenic, that means heat producing, and they smell strongly of rotting meat. And they attract the, ins the insects and they capture them overnight and then they release them to go and pollinate another plant. One of these is called the dead horse arum. It lives on Mediterranean cliffs among seagull colonies. Blue bottle flies come along and they see this plant that looks like a dead animal that drapes over the rocks and it smells like a dead animal. They're, they go inside and they're trapped overnight and then the spines that have captured them wither and they're able to escape and go on to pollinate another. Then there's the Aristolachia arborea. Rainfor In the rainforests of Central America, it grows from the base of a tree trunk. It smells and resembles fungus, like a mushroom. And fungus gnats come along and lay their eggs. Unfortunately, the eggs will perish since it was laid on a fake mushroom. And the last thing in this category is the Titan Arum. It is a giant plant. It lives in the forest of Sumatra, but it's made up of tiny flowers, so it's not a single bloom. It can reach up to 10 feet. It smells like sweaty socks and rotting fish. But after flowering, it can take seven to 10 years to bloom again. The accomplices are when animals and plants work together. The bird of paradise perch on the blue arrowhead-like petals. The flowers open to thrust pollen onto the bird's breast. Some birds cling to the side to avoid the pollen. They don't wanna get pollen all over their feathers. Then there's the ant plants. It's in Southeast Asia. It has specialized hollow nesting structures. The smooth walled chambers are for nesting. And then there's rough warty chambers that ants put waste in. And the plant then uses the nutrients from the waste. There's the fanged pitcher plant in Borneo. Ants live in the plant's coiled, swollen, and hollow tendrils, and they consume the plant's nectar. But they also attack the weevils that would damage the plant's roots. And they can dive into the pitcher fluid without harm. Other animals that fall into the pitcher fluid get digested, but these ants can jump in and swim around without any problems. There's the bat pitcher plant. It's a Bornean species. It doesn't smell, it has no fragrance, but it has a prominent ridge for the bats to cling to when they're um, sleeping. Enlarged openings reflect ultrasound calls, so it's easy to locate. Bat droppings fall into the bowls. This is in a nutrient poor rainforest. Now we're going to be talking about some survivor plants. These are ones that survive in deserts where the the conditions are extremely harsh. There's one type of plant called half men. From a distance, they look just like people. And so people started calling them half men. They live in the Orange River region, North Cape and South Nambian Desert. They can reach up to 13 feet tall. 
They have just a few leaves on the very top of the plant that wither and fall off when the, the desert gets really hot. There's water storage in the pillar. It's 13 feet tall and it has lots of water in it. And they're believed to be able to live for several centuries. That's pretty amazing in an area that's so hard to survive in. There's the Welwistia. It's a monotypic species. That means there's only one species attached to this type. It lives in the deserts of the Atlantic sea belt of Nambia and Angola. It's a gymnosperm. It's related to pines. Some plants are a thousand years old. That's hard to believe. It only has two leaves that grow throughout the life of the plant. They grow to six and a half to 13 feet long, becoming split and frayed. There's the Coco de Mer palm. It's an island survivor. It's the largest seed in the plant kingdom. That's 37 pounds of weight. It can be up to 37 pounds. It's native to say chilies. It can live, the plant, the trees can live up to 200 years old, but it, the trees take a long time to reestablish. If you chop down one of these palm trees, it's very hard to grow new ones. The last section that we're talking about are the hitchhikers, the ones that spread their seeds around with help from other animals or people. The first is the durian. It, it lives in Southeast Asia. It is considered king of fruits. The fruit is 12 inches across. Its flesh is prized for its sweetness, but it has a strong aroma it smells like rotting onions and sewage. It's hard to believe something that's so sweet can smell so bad. In fact, it is bought, banned from public transport and hotels in the area where it grows. It is bat pollinated, but the seeds are spread because it is attractive to birds and animals. They eat the, sweet, the flesh, swallow the seeds, and disperse them in their droppings. There's the snake gourd. It's from the melon and pumpkin family. Growers tie rocks to the bottom to straighten it out. It can be up to a meter long, and it is spread by people. The last one that we're talking about today and this one sounded fascinating to me, was the traveler's palm. It's not actually a palm, but it lives in Madagascar and its seed appendages, see these things that look like leaves around the edge, are a very unusual color. Most seeds and fruits that are attractive to birds are red, but there's very few birds that could disperse this seeds in the area of Madagascar where it grows. So it is eaten and dispersed by lemurs and lemurs see in shades of blue and green. So its seed appendages are a beautiful shade of blue so that it's attractive to lemurs. Now in closing, I hope that you have enjoyed all of learning about all the wild and wonderful plants in our world and how they have adapted to survive in many different conditions. I hope that you would be interested in learning more about different types of plants. Get this book or maybe find some other books on plants because it's amazing, absolutely amazing what plants can become and look like and do. Thank you for coming to my program. Stay safe. Bye-bye.